Hello, this is Peter Bell, and I'm here with Mr. Jim Sykes. Jim. Hi, Peter. How are you doing? Very well. So, first time to talk with you. I'm afraid I haven't even met you in person, but nope. always uh, have our ear to the ground looking for opportunity. And I see news out today from Appia Energy, October 10th, 2018. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, we were very excited about that news. I was uh, just mentioning that we've completed our summer project up at Alsace Lake where we were exploring for some high-grade critical rare earths. So critical basically applying to the rare earths that are going into the permanent magnets today. And yeah, we're, it's an exciting project for us, uh, especially last year when we did some work on it and we identified the, the potential growth of the rare earth industry. And so we really wanted to do a do a good program this summer and that's yeah it's basically what our news was about um, the completion of that a very good program the frustration of waiting for things to happen in the rare earth space is profound uh, i think a lot of people have been thrown off by it in years gone by interesting to hear you say that it was only last year that it became a focus for you within this company is that is that correct? Uh, basically, yes. Yeah. The, the, well, the company's held on to it. We've always liked it, but again, there was no, there was no marketplace for it, especially after that uh, the Chinese monopoly. Um, had to wait for for prices to come back and wait for the realization that you know people needed uh, permanent magnets, which really drove this whole rare earth play. Uh, so yeah. So as once those elements started to come back into play, then it definitely uh, became a big focus for us, which almost conveniently enough for us was we were seeing uranium go the opposite way. So uranium was falling for us. And uh, at one point, we, when we were raising money, we couldn't get a dime for rare earths. Nobody wanted to hear the story. No. And, you know, flip around a year later, nobody wants to hear the uranium story. They wanted to hear the rare earth story. So it's, you know, we're, we're kind of fortunate that we actually have both the, uh, both the assets on our, on our uh, property exploration plate. Well, and they tend to go together, don't they, geologically speaking? In a way, it yeah, it it depends on the um, it depends on the host and the and the geological setting. Uh, for us on this one, we do actually have uranium up at Alsa's. It's part of monazite, and it's just it, it it's at a lower grade than what we would typically explore for, especially being up in that Athabasca Basin area, where you know uranium grade is king up there. That's but having uranium as a byproduct from Alsace Lake is definitely a good thing for us. Lots more questions, of course. Always many things to discuss. Thanks for talking to me here. Uh, I This number, 47.2% by weight, uh, total rare earth oxide, that would seem to be particularly rich. Absolutely. Well, when you actually consider that that's only for the rare earth, um, when you convert all of that into monazite, which is the host mineral for the rare earths that we have up at up at Alsace Lake, uh, that outcrop up there is is about 85% monazite. You know, if you think about if you want to put that in terms of gold, like 85% gold right at surface, that's just that's mind blowing. But it's yeah, it's definitely very rich up there, um, especially walking around and. After what we've done this summer when we exposed a lot of the outcrops, well, I won't say a lot of the outcrops, but we exposed a number of the outcrops that were uh, easily accessible, you can you can definitely see um, monazite clearly right at surface, and it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. It's, and, I was really excited is, to see a lot of it. Yeah, it's it's a, an, a particular host unit of interest too, right? So when you say 85% or... You know the comparison to gold there is is a stretch, right? But this monazite unit itself is what this. It's familiar to me um, with medallion and the monazite sands. I believe it is right. Um, is this yep. is this a hard rock setting of? That? Yes, absolutely. The geological Great. setting we're actually in, we are in in an old mountain belt. So basically, uh, where we are up in northern Saskatchewan, the you know, billions of years ago, two two billion to one point nine billion years ago, 
Uh, there's a huge mountain belt there they say was larger than the Himalayas today. That's all been eroded, so now we're looking at the root system of it. And that's where we are seeing our, our uh, monazite deposits. Yeah. So, yeah, quite quite different from what Medallion's doing with the sands. However, um, when you look at a typical sand operation, uh, their grades are much lower. Uh, their, their total rare earth grades are typically uh, it's even 1% to stretch. Yeah, it's they're, they're typically sand. much lower than that. Yep, very different. Yeah, it's yeah. amazing how broad you know the statistical and geological properties of this stuff can be, right? Um, what's I wonder, you know, the hardness and stuff of uh, the, the monazite mineralization there that you have in core. The, uh, the hardness of the actual core itself—that's uh, yeah. something I wouldn't be able to say. But um, the the one thing that I can say is that the monazite we have is, you know, monazite's monazite. It might have a little bit of different um, elemental ratios, but monazite's monazite. It's still made up of all the same type of, of elements and everything. Uh, what we have is, again, we're fortunate in the way, though, that our monazite hasn't been eroded. So we actually have very coarse-grained monazite, which will help um, any type of processing or, or milling <laughs> So if we want to remove, if we want to, when we want to remove the host rock, it's going to be pretty simple and easy to do. Yeah. Is, we're not, we're not looking at the submicron scale. We can pick this stuff out and we can hold it by hand. Yeah. Well, but who knows what happens down the line with the process and stuff. Sometimes you end up grinding and re-grinding, floating in between. It's, modern metallurgy is a field beyond me. Uh, I wonder, Likewise. is there anybody, right? Is there anybody mining anything like this for this purpose? Not, not that I can, not that I can tell. Uh, Linus would be the, uh, I guess the closest comparison. Uh, Steen Comp Scroll down in South Africa used to be mined. Uh, they were mining giant veins. So, but still a slightly different uh, comparison, but I, from what I can tell, there's nobody else mining anything like this. Well, I'm sure there is somewhere. The world's a big place. Yeah, and I it don't. Is. Yes. And I don't know about the comparison with uh, with Linus there, right? But there's so much interesting stuff happening. <laughs> I'm sorry to see their their uh, their name in the news recently, and uh, yeah, all the concerns international you know, processing and shipping of there's some case to be made for dealing with uh, radioactive stuff in Saskatchewan in Canada, um, safety and security. <laughs> Very important. Fortunately, this is fortunately, this is the province to do it in though, because we have, we've got the highest grade uranium mines in the world. So Saskatchewan is a province that is very comfortable with and knows how to deal with uh, radioactive rocks and yeah. radioactive uh, mining and milling. So, yeah, if as far as jurisdictions go, I don't think we could have gotten anything better than than having something here in Saskatchewan. Well, and you're and you are there, right? Yep. Yep. Wonderful. Uh, looking forward, uh, work through the winter. Um, any talk of drilling out on the lakes? Unfortunately, well, uh, where we're sitting with uh, with our zones, we're actually not on a lake, uh, which is very good thing for us. We're we're up on a little hill there. Um, yeah, hills in Saskatchewan, what a weird concept. But yeah. uh, as far as the winter goes, it's it's uh, the the property area does not prove to be favorable for the winter at this point. Uh, we know we can put a road in, but uh, one of the problems that we've addressed is that. It would be costlier for us to drill in the winter than a normal drill project in the winter, simply because of the uh, the elevation change from where we would need to pull the water out from the lake um, <laughs> to to where we go and the distance we'd have to travel and uh, the wind. Even uh, we noticed being up on the hill, uh, we're we're buffeted with a lot of cold wind. Uh, being down on the ground, it was you know slightly warm. As soon as you get up on the hill, it's just that much colder. So we would freeze our water lines unless we kept it heated, and to keep it heated would require uh, more heaters and propane and more people yeah. to run yeah. those heaters. So, so we figure that we would stand a better chance to do it all again next summer. 
and also being able to physically see it, I think that is probably the best option for us to move forward. Yep. Unfortunately, it just means the company is going to be quiet on the on the rare earth front for, well, except for the news coming out um, for the remainder of the assays that we have. But otherwise, yes, on the on the rare earth front at Alsa's Lake, we will be quiet for the winter. But we'll use that time to strategize going forward and and planning up for our next summer project and and getting the rest of the equipment that we need and everything like that. Well, there's doing some metallurgy work and yeah, start what start taking some of those samples around uh see who's interested in talking to you about those pieces of rock right because you need to get a a partner you need some kind of a strategic uh assistance to you know step it up to the level where right because if the, if it's a case of something that hasn't been done before in terms of mine method and uh product you know, creation, you know, what you come up with on the other side of rare earth uh, mining and processing is highly specialized suite of products, right? Um, and there's all this talk about, you know, the US supply chain, blah, blah, blah. What supply chain, right? Uh, maybe there's one coming, but um, it's not here yet, as far as I know. And there are discussions afoot, right? So for a fleet footed little junior like you, uh, this is it. <laughs> There's bigger opportunity out there. Not, we've also addressed that as well. And earlier in the year, we actually talked with some companies uh, who do use, end users of rare earths, and they were mentioning that this whole Chinese situation <laughs> does create a problem for them for fear of that that uh, break in the supply chain. So they would like to have something that is, you know, from short term to long term, knowing that they're not going to not going to default or not going to have to pay exorbitant some amount of, of dollars for, for a product that they know they can get cheaper. So yeah, it's uh we know that we know that the end users out are out there. And again, that is something else that uh, we will definitely look at pursuing. If we can come out with, uh, with, with an agreement with somebody who would, who definitely use our product, then yes, that's, that's a huge bonus for us. Well, and it's like not going to happen by chance, right? It's you're going to make no, it happen. No. It's... Exactly. Yeah. And like we were talking about with the the grades there, you know, when we're seeing almost fifty percent, fifty percent total rare earths, and close to a hundred percent monazite. Again, we've talked to uh, people in the labs, and you know, their eyes just bug out when we tell them these grades, mm -hmm. and. They've they've seen nothing like it. It's already pre concentrated. You've got companies yeah. out there, rare earth companies out there, who are looking at uh, pre concentrating their their stuff to two percent, five percent, ten percent if they're lucky, maybe even twenty percent. You know, we've got that naturally. Yeah. So there, there's no real pre concentrate needed. We've you know, we've looked at this ourselves and just you know with the grade that's out there, this is it's it's like an artisanal mining situation. We can go out there, wow. pickaxe and shovel. And just start ripping the stuff off surface and just shipping it on down. It's it's a very <laughs> simple situation. It's it, it it's quite impressive. Like it's, I would love to bring everybody up there and see it because it, it's something to witness up there. You know, as much as I can show pictures or show graphs or just talk to people about it, it's something else to physically go up and see it, and people can understand. Wow, you know, this is really easy to move. Yeah. Well, and if you have rock that is unique in some way, right? Um, I don't know if some of the things you're finding are museum kind of specimens, you know, looking in some sense, right? Um, there's a long history of people finding pretty special rock, you know, all over the world, right? And different types of rocks that you know, set new records and things like that. So I don't know if I would be curious to to hear more about the, you know, the global comparables for this type of setting. And, and that, yeah, that may be interesting if you're able to find some celebrity pieces of rock that you can go shop around to people in the world to, to show them. Right. Um, even if you can't get them to come up there, you can show them the rocks and let them do some testing with it. Ideally that I would be very keen to hear that too. 
Yeah, well, that's that's an interesting point to actually getting the, getting some samples in the Canadian Canadian Museum out there in Ottawa. That would be great. It, if it's, they're noteworthy it's enough, that you right? Mention that. Yeah, yeah. There's um on our presentation we have one slide that shows you know our graph. Uh, well, shows a graph of uh, the top you know the top tier rare earth companies and. You know, these guys all have advanced projects. They've all got PAs and feasibility studies, and, uh, excluding China, obviously. Um, but from taking the the results that we had from last year, and this was including channel cuts, a couple channel cuts that we did, but also including um, Barren Rock, just to you know almost dilute our our samples. Um, the grades that we're seeing rank up there as uh, as top tier. You know we're we're, we're yeah. a top five grade, yeah. so it's it's yeah. those it's these kind of projects that move forward in the rare earth industry and you know can actually make a very good run of things. Well, and in a spasmodic kind of fashion too, right? The the rare earth industry, <laughs> that's what is that? You know, I wonder what it will look like in twenty years, and no kidding, and, pro yeah. and properties like this in Saskatchewan, right? Like this is premier. Yeah stuff um in some versions of the world right uh yeah well, like like every other commodity um people are always going to find substitutions they're always going to try and replace things and make things cheaper which yeah that's you know that's business and the thing i like about the rare earth industry is yes there are people who are trying to replace rare earths and the end products that they use but there are also people who are doing um, additional research on finding new uses for rare earths. So again, yeah, in 20 years, you know, we don't know what's going to be there. Uh, yeah. As far as as far as what you know, a lot of the industry professionals, especially the ones uh, who are making magnets, are saying, there's nothing better than a than the neodymium, iron, boron, uh, rare earth permanent magnet today. There's nothing better than. Is there anything on the horizon? No. 10 years down the road who knows but yeah. at this current point and stage and as far as what research has come up come up with there's nothing better than that magnet yeah. so that's so what we can take away from that right now is that's you know now is the time to be in it what's it going to look like in 20 years down the road hopefully with more technological applications out there that do require these magnets or do require other uses of rare earths i hope that's definitely there well, and there's so many questions too in regards to Appia Energy Corp, you know, specifically, um, without even getting into them really here today. Just, I'd say for anyone, you know, who wants to know more, uh, please reach out to Mr. James Sykes at 306-221-8717, jsykes at uraniumgeologist.com. Absolutely. Yep. I'm always open for uh, always open for a call and to explain and uh, let people know, update people with whatever. And I just like to talk. And a question for you. Yep. The the news release out today, Figure One, um, high grade yep. showing at surface that you mentioned. That's the hill with all <laughs> the brutal winds. Yep. Is that within? the um existing any existing resource domains no okay how far is that from any mention of other uh, 43101 stuff on the property i believe uh we have no 43101 resource on our property or close to it um i guess the closest things that we're well we're about 30 kilometers northeast of uranium city Uranium City at one point in time uh, used to have quite a number of uh, uranium mines operating. So, you know, they've they've got power there, they've got the airstrip, they've got a, quite a bit of infrastructure. Um, so that's you know, that also helps us out um, looking at actually getting something up and running. Uh, being so isolated from where we are, uh, we are up in the middle of the bush. You now there's no road access there. There's no road access to Uranium City, not in the summertime anyway. In the winter time there's an yeah. ice road that goes there. Yeah. So, and that's, you know, there's been over 60 million pounds of uranium removed from uranium city. So we know that of all these mines that were operational, they were able to get their product out. We can do the same thing. So it's where we are is not really a hindrance, but 
Yeah, and as far as being close to, you know, if there's any other resource up there. Um, or well, the Teasdale. Resource. What's the Teasdale, right? That the Teasdale zone, is that something? Completely different. No, Teasdale zone is actually yeah. in Elliott Lake, Ontario. Yeah. That's a couple provinces over, but that's, um, again, it's a, it's a basement, well, not basement hosted, but it's, it's a underground mine situation there. Um, plaster deposits, uh, uranium and, and monazite at, at Elliott Lake. And it's, um, it is lower grade, much lower grade than what we're seeing at ULSA's, but it's, uh, it's something on our back pocket that we'd like to hold on to with, um, you know, if the price of uranium ever does skyrocket again, or the price of rare earths take off, just you know, with these, who knows what's going to happen with these trade wars? Yeah, you know, it's, I see, I see it as a big boon for the for our industry anyway, in uranium and rare earths. So, well, I wonder, yeah, how? And you said Teesdale deep. I wonder how deep it is. Is it over under five hundred? Uh, yeah. No, well, it's it's a sh- it's a shallow dipping. Um, um, sedimentary unit, yeah, and where we yeah, have you mentioned it, the placer, yeah, yeah. So it's um, I think we have it about uh, 125 meters depth, where we have it tagged, and it goes down to about 250 meters. Hard rock, all around it. Yes, it, yeah, yeah, it would be hard rock for sure. Elliott Lake is a historic mining camp. Uh, it used to be uranium capital of the world. Uh, I'm from Elliott Lake myself. My dad was a miner yeah. there. At, uh, he was mining uranium. Um, yeah, it, it's a very stable, uh, good geological location. Um, it's uh, all the infrastructures there as well. It's, again, just the, the grade is the only part that's, that's kind of um, uh, hindering it at the moment. <laughs> well, this, yeah, versus the samples that, yeah, you're talking about here. All says Lake in Saskatchewan. Pickaxe and shovel. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I wonder if you have published anything around the size. I see that there's no scale on that photograph. Nope. Um, it would be interesting to have some estimate of potential dimensions of different things there and tonnage and all that. As we come out with more of the results, yep. um, we will better define we will better define the um, what we have at surface, but also what we discovered subsurface. At that yes. point, then we can start uh, putting out more of a scale and things. Um, well, myself, thank you. I've I've got a geological model in place that I have to that I have to get out there to the um, to the public audience. Uh, it's just a matter of, of getting around to do it because I've got a lot on my plate at the moment, but it's. Yep. It's in my head, and it has to be done sooner rather than later. And I think yeah. that will that will help um, also help put a scale on things and and show where our um, you know our, our targeting for the future will be, and and just the, the the potential on the property is is overwhelming. Yeah, are you and going to be able to get back to... up there again before next year? I. We could. You know, we can always take the take the ski plane and things are freezing up there, which is why we had to get out. Um, our camp water line was even freezing, and within one day, uh, the day that we actually flew out uh, overnight, we had at least two oh, feet no. of ice uh, form up on shore. So we knew it was time to get out. <laughs> oh <Yeah>. lord, <laughs> what an adventure yeah. going up there! Oh, it was it, it was a fun time. I got to say, it was a very fun summer. Lots of lots of things happening, but uh, definitely very fun. The locals up there were actually saying that this they haven't seen this cold weather hit northern yeah. Saskatchewan in at least 30 years. So again, it's just our luck that you know we had a good thing going, and we had to get out of there early. We planned well, on being knew. there. That's where experience right? comes in. That's where experience comes into play. That's you know yeah. your <laughs> generations and decades of <laughs> your your own experience and all the guys around you and everyone, all the people that you have involved in supporting, uh, you know, this, this public company, Appia Energy. <laughs> it's, uh, it's such an undertaking. Always, uh, I'm always impressed, you know, when any, anyone ever gets anything done in this business, it seems the cards are all stacked against. So yeah, good for you. Yeah, I'd, all, I'd also like to point out that what we did up there this season, I think 
was accomplished at a lower budget than what a peer company probably could have done. We had our own drill build for us, which really shaved a lot of the drill costs. Uh, we got an excavator up there, which, you know, without that excavator, that project would have been, it would have been a nightmare. But that excavator just cleaned everything up quick. And so you're out in the middle of nowhere. The, the helicopter had to be flown in by helicopter. And it was worth it. <laughs> Good for you. Well, you know, on the back of one successful season, hopefully there's another, right? <laughs> 2019, right I around the corner. I think it can only get better. I, I don't, yeah. this can only get better. Like we've, what? especially having, especially having this geological model like, floating around in my mind, um, before going up, you know, I, I kind of knew a little bit of the pieces, but I didn't even have the, the outline of the puzzle done. Um, you know, where I'm at right now, you know, the outline's done. I've got the picture coming together. It still may not be 100% complete, but it's it, night and day from yep. last year to this year. And that's, yep. for me, that's the big thing. I'm a, you know, I'm an explorationist till the day I die. It's, you know, it's a love affair, I guess. <laughs> but knowing knowing what we have now and seeing seeing how everything kind of fits together it paints a beautiful picture and it just again it just opens these doors for prospectivity well and now and that we've you... also staked we've also staked a larger a larger property around the Alsas around our original Alsas Lake property and that that uh, newer property also has two zones of interest that share similar qualities to what we're seeing uh, where we were exploring. So again, we've got, you know, that it's just that prospectivity is there, it, and it's it's just going to get better and better as we well, uncover more and learn more. Please tell me, you know, six months from now that you had some samples of that forty plus percent, you know, highest um, grade total and critical rare earth element mineralization in the world. Some of some of that material. You know, tell me that you take some photos of it traveling around the world as much as you can. Uh, yeah. It's probably it's probably not it's that's probably not possible with if it's radioactive. You know, if it's hot, you're gonna have you shouldn't do that. But you know, you've the the potential for some some of that some business development, right? With some of this, when you're setting record and finding stuff that's if it is really the highest grade in the world, there's gonna be people all over I think the world who will want to see it and. You have an opportunity, obligation, right, to the mining industry yeah, to share absolutely. some of this stuff, and it's great. You represent not the Canada. Highest, not the highest grade rare earths, but it's it's not the highest grade rare earths. Um, what we've identified is uh, the Gakara project in Africa, Burundi. Uh, that seems to have the highest grades, and that's you know it's again it's another good project. But what we have is you know it it's up there. It's you know if not. If not the second or third best, then it's definitely within the top five. Um, I would say it's closer to the second second highest grades in the world. Uh, that Ivan zone, you know, I've I've actually got a, a pretty good video that I have to get up on the website. It's about 15 seconds long, and it's it shows how easy it was for us to take a sample for for metallurgy use. Pickaxe and shovel. It wasn't even a pickaxe this time. <laughs> it's just yeah. a simple hammer and a crowbar, and let's take some chunks off the rock and throw it on in. Yeah. Yeah. Surface showing is always a good place to start. <laughs> yeah. All right, James, I think we've pounded them long enough. Is there anything else you'd like to say to anybody that might still be listening? I would definitely say keep your eyes on Appia. Um, again, we're, we're not just the rare earth story, which we do have um, some more, some more news coming out. We've only got about 25% of our samples, uh, sample results back so far. So that means 75% of our sample results will be coming hopefully within the next, in the coming weeks, let's say anyway. Um, so again, we should have some exciting news coming out, but we're not just a rare earth play. We're also uranium play and, you know, we keep our nose to the ground on that one. And you know, we see the price of uranium keep coming, uh, keeps climbing up. So we're excited about that. We've got some beautiful uranium properties that uh, we will hopefully be exploring next summer as well. Maybe even this winter, we don't know yet. Well, get Again, into, uh, do some, you know, we would like to hear about those as well, please. I'm sure. Oh, for, yeah, for <laughs> sure. Absolutely. 
right? So it, with if, with the uranium take on things, um, well, but not so much not right now, but just you know, okay, in in news releases, right? Like if it gets, you were saying it's going to get quiet, right, at some point with you know no more work on this stuff in Saskatchewan, Alster Lake shift over right and and let's let's hear more about the uranium stuff after that like if you have stuff to option um i don't i don't know if you noticed but it's a looks like a raging bull market out there and i'm sure that you could uh you know get some good looking terms um for some prospective ground you know cameco is selling stuff at pretty low prices but there may be opportunity out there for you guys to do better yeah well we've we like some of Cameco's ground, but um, our focus is outside of the basin. We don't want yeah. to be within that sand zone. That's just a, yeah. that's an engineering nightmare. It seems to be, doesn't it? It's like I wonder if that'll go down in the history books. <laughs> I, I I don't know, but uh, there's uh, I've I've got a whole talk on that one. But yeah, like you said, uh, time wise, we can always talk about that later. If anybody else, if anybody ever wants to contact me about it, I've uh, I can. Just write up a nice big uh, article on that on why we should be looking in the basement and and not in the sandstone. Actually, Put Roger it in a Wallace press release, Kerr, James. Yeah, see it, Roger Wallace and Bill Kerr did a wonderful paper on that, and they were the they were the driving force behind um, Appiah's thinking going forward. Yeah, well, and you uh, carry that torch and and go where it takes you, right? That's about being an explorationist. That's it. Yep. Thank you very much for talking to me today. Uh, real treat. No worries, Peter. My pleasure. Oh, it's uh, great to finally talk with you, and uh, uh, I'm sure we'll be doing this again sometime in the near future once we have a presentation updated for you. <laughs> Thanks. Goodbye.